Okay, there, thank you. Um, I appreciate all of your um, uh, presence here today. And uh, I think if get rid of, okay, there we go. Uh, continue, I'm sorry, just following the directions here. Anyway, um, today's presentation, even though it's uh, focused on administrative, I'm gonna try and use examples that would be appropriate for administrative staff, but I'm also the general, the general subject matter stays the same. Um, what you are going to see is that I've put a little bit at the end that's involving COVID because COVID um, absolutely has changed our practices and has influenced um, this group, this population that we're gonna be working with. So, uh, okay, now, oh, there we go. So um, what I need to do is, there we go, okay. So the purpose today is you're going to be able to uh, identify what a substance use disorder is and, and the recovery process, not just the disorder, but how things get better. Um, you'll be able to distinguish the difference between a recovery coach um, and a uh, workforce career counselor and the different strategies each uses um, to do their job. Um, you'll learn something about the clients and the challenges that a client does present uh, when they have a substance use disorder. Um, and then uh, we'll talk a bit about what it looks like to, for recovery uh, coaches and workforce staff to work together. Uh, my experience uh, to date has been very successful. And so uh, we'd like to share that. Uh, but just to give you a sense of uh, the, the landscape, this is the, um, uh, a chart of national drug overdose deaths uh, for, through 2018. Um, that's the, the information that was available. However, um, I can tell you that uh, 2019 and 2020 um, follow the same pattern. So you'll see that the bright yellow line, that's probably the most uh, um, uh, stark difference in the overdoses. That's a drug called fentanyl. And fentanyl is a uh, manufactured uh, opioid that has been um, infiltrated in our system that's causing a tremendous amount of trouble. So as you can see, the, uh, some of the other drugs have maintained or gone up in small amounts, but fentanyl has really hit um, our communities hard. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in, in a bit. Um, in 2019, uh, we saw, uh, Nationally, there was a dip in overdose deaths, a slight dip, not a large dip, but a slight dip. And then in 2020, um, we saw that rise again because of COVID and the changes that happened with COVID. So um, we're not in a um, uh, reduction state at this point. And here's a more clear view of uh, the number of people that are dying um, uh, across ages. And um, what I wanna point out that um, the, between 30 and 40 is the age group that um, has the most number of overdose deaths. Uh, that's when things peak and um, uh, because people have been using and they end up um, overdosing and dying. And, and sometimes we see that move forward a little bit and getting older as the group ages, but it's pre stayed pretty consistent. So what is a substance use disorder? Um, and I use this language very specifically because it's very important that we use language that is not shaming, that is not um, uh, negative towards the person who has this disorder. Um, because it's a medical diagnosis. And so we should treat people in the same way that someone else would have a diagnosis of cancer or multiple sclerosis or any, um, any diagnosis. Um, so a substance use disorder occurs when you cannot control um, your use of alcohol and drugs and it causes a significant clinical impairment. Um, what does that mean? That means you have health problems, you have heart problems, you have liver problems, you have kidney problems, um, you, uh, it causes disability, meaning you have not able to uh, uh, function in the same healthy way that you used to. Um, I'll give you an example, uh, someone who is an opioid user for long term 
often ends up with heart disease, um, uh, particularly uh, serious heart disease because of the um, of the in, the in um, the reaction to the drug. Um, alcohol, I'm sure many of you know that alcohol uh, will destroy your liver, uh, but it also has uh, can hurt your kidneys and it can hurt your heart and it can hurt a lot of your organs. Um, so a person ends up with significant health problems, but they also fail to meet their major responsibilities at work, school, or home. So uh, basically the, um, the substance, the disorder takes over. The craving for um, the drug or the uh, alcohol is more than the importance of going to work, making a living, taking care of their family. They've lost total control of their use and the frequency and their compulsion to use is what is most important. Um, when you start using a specific substance, uh, particularly with opioids, you'll, you start to develop a tolerance for that. Um, this is kind of how the disorder starts. And the tolerance means that you um, don't get the same reaction that you do the first time you take that substance. Uh, for instance, with, with pain medication, if someone who has chronic pain and takes uh, pain medication, when they first take it, they feel better. They get relief with their pain. But soon they find that the same amount does not give them the same relief. So what do people do? They start increasing that dose um, and because they've reached a point where it no longer has the same effect. So they start taking more of the drug or they take it more frequently, but they take it off um, your doctor's orders. As you do that, your body responds to that and expects you to be able to provide that substance to them on a daily basis. And you start to develop a physical dependence. What does that mean? It means that if you stop that drug, you will have physical response to it. You might sweat, you might get aches and pains, you might have uh, be, un be unable to sleep, but you notice the fact that you're not taking the medication. When you are no longer uh, able to manage your cravings for that drug um, and you lose control of the ability to uh, put it aside and, and not use, you have a full-blown addiction. And that's kind of how we describe it. That's a continuum uh, that can occur. And depending on what the substance is, that is the time, the timeline changes based on the substance. Um, but you will see that it's important. People will say to you, oh, I'm a social drinker or, or I only use on the weekends or you know, they'll, they'll minimize their substance um, use. And um, what you have to determine is, is it a problem yet or not? Um, we see an urgent need right now for uh, overdose prevention uh, based on um, the uh, current situation with COVID. 80% um, of drug overdose deaths involve opioids. So what that means is anyone who has an accidental overdose death, 80%, 80 out of 100 people have an opioid overdose. So um, and now we're starting to see that um, many of those overdose deaths containing opioids contain other drugs too. So 85% of overdose deaths involve um, illicitly manufactured fentanyls, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit, heroin, cocaine, or methamphetamine, alone or in combination. That combination is, is striking what we've seen, and it's very frightening. Um, it's frightening because uh, fentanyl is a manufactured opioid, meaning um, heroin is a, a drug uh, opioid that's made from poppies. Uh, it's poppies are grown in the fields, they're picked, they're manufactured, or they're treated, and they're developed. But it, they're, um, it takes labor, it's time consuming and more expensive. Fentanyl, on the other hand, is made in the laboratory. Uh, it's a duplication of the same chemical composition. And we're seeing that more and more different types of fentanyls are being created and they have different responses in the body. Uh, they're very dangerous and very powerful uh, substances. Potentially opportunities to link people to care or to implement life-saving actions were, were, this is the part that's so hard to understand and so hard to grasp is that 
this is not like having heart disease where you go to your family doctor and you get assistance and you go to the cardiologist or you go to the cardiac surgeon. I mean, there's a, there's a, a, a way to follow through with that with your physician's help. Um, when you have a substance use disorder, you're on your own to be able to identify the care, care, caregiver that you go to. Um, you're on your own to figure out how to get into that caregiver, whether you have the right insurance or not, how to get in, into detox. It's all independent. Um, and that's problematic because what we're finding is that three out of five people who died from overdoses were not able to get the life-saving care they needed. So we're based, we have a problem out there um, that the barriers to care are significantly impacting that. So um, Dr. Volkoff is the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse um, for um, NIDA. And um, she's a well-known expert in this arena um, and has shown, demonstrated, she was the first person to demonstrate that um, drug addiction is a disease of the human brain. So when you think about that, your brain is an organ, just like your heart um, um, or your liver or your kidneys, they're organs in the body um, that are uh, grow and develop as you age, as, as a child, your brain continues to grow until you're 27 years old. Um, and that organ um, gets diseased and Many of us are more familiar with uh, tumors or uh, tumors and brain cancer that may occur in the brain. Uh, some of you might have heard of brain bleeds or um, traumatic brain injuries. Um, these are all diseases that happen in the, as part of the brain. Um, we know more and more about it now because we're able to visualize it through our uh, technology. But um, it's no longer okay to reference someone who has a substance use disorder as lacking, as being weak and lacking will. Um, it's not about their choices, it's about the disease and how it impacts their body. Um, in many ways, people will say to you, well, they, they made a choice to start using. Well, when let's take opioids medication, you don't you make a choice because your doctor prescribed it and you have pain. Now that starts sometimes the, um, uh, the journey that could take you into um, addiction. Um, the same thing with alcohol, you know, you start as a social drinker and then uh, because of other reasons you start to use more frequently, develop a tolerance, same kind of process. But the bottom line is it's your brain that's uh, creating that uh, experience. So um, Dr. Volkoff uh, documented um, what happens in the brain when these substances are introduced. Um, it affects the dopamine system, um, which is the part of the frontal lobe of your brain. Um, that's the area that, that um, increases your motivation and your self-regulation. The frontal lobe is the last part of your brain to develop. It's your decision-making area. Um, and so uh, it's really important. And when it's influenced by the medications or the narcotics that people are ingesting, it changes the way your brain functions. Um, if this uh, visual shows someone who um, has been using methamphetamine um, and uh, here's a healthy brain. In the healthy brain, if you see the spots that are lit up um, that brain is functioning um, well. Um, this is a uh, brain that is one month um, uh, after use. So look at what's missing in the brain, okay? So that's, that's only one month in recovery. Um, and then we start to see after 14 months in recovery, uh, the brain starts to come back. Uh, and starts to heal, but it takes a long time. And um, 
sometimes we think that after 30 days of treatment, someone gets out of treatment and everything's back to normal. It's not like your appendix where you go into the hospital, you get your appendix out and you go home and you take a couple of weeks to heal from the surgery and then everything is back to normal. No, um, a brain disease causes changes in your brain that take a, a time to heal or may not heal at all. So what causes a substance use disorder? And this is important, and this is how you, you determine the, the, the humanity behind the person, okay? So I'm, we're it is, it's a brain disease, but there are risk factors for developing that brain disease. Um, the first one is family history and genetics. So if there is alcoholism or uh, substance use or gambling, or any type of addiction in your family, and we're talking way back, not just the last generation, um, then you have a 50% higher propensity to develop that addiction. Um, and uh, we, that's, it doesn't necessarily translate into the same addiction. It could translate into a different kind. So if you have alcohol use disorder in your family, you may see later generations developing opioid use disorders. Um, but the bottom line is the brain is affected and that you're carrying those genes from generation to generation. Um, the next one is if someone has a mental health disorder, um, they're more likely to be uh, misusing medications, um, uh, substances, um, substances or alcohol in a way that they um, are self-medicating. Um, and uh, it's important to remember that when people are in recovery or when they're healing, that the mental health disorder is just as important to be uh, managed as the substance use disorder. It's not one or the other, the chicken and the egg, it's a co-occurring situation that needs to be treated. And then um, the third factor uh, is your environment. So if you, if you live in a home where people are using substances, you're more likely to use those substances. If you hang out with uh, people who use substances, you're more likely to use those substances. If um, you are in a community um, where it's, you know where to find the substances, then in your environment, all of that leads to an environment that makes access easier. Um, so the, the also the, out of that environment, the one factor that's where most of our um, uh, uh, research is going on these days and has a tremendous impact is what we call adverse childhood experiences or basically trauma. Um, trauma is at the heart of a lot of people who are struggling with a substance use disorder. Um, the kinds of experiences I'm talking about are um, you may have grown up in a situation where there's um, child abuse, where you're abused or a family member is being abused and you're witnessing that. Um, or it could be also spousal abuse uh, and you witness that. Um, it could be a situation where someone in your family has a substance use disorder, whether it be alcohol or substances, and you witness that behavior and that's traumatizing to a child. Um, children wanna feel safe and, and when they see things in their environment that are not uh, helping them feel safe, then um, they respond to it in certain types of ways those responses stay with them the rest of their lives. Um, so uh, we find that people, children who have pa a parent who's been incarcerated, um, a child who's moved around a lot, you know, doesn't have a home base or is homeless. Um, any of those types of traumas will make an impact on the person. And when they're stressed as an adult, their responses may be the same as they were when they were a child. Um, we often say, uh, I point out that when uh, a person starts to use a substance uh, uh, inappropriately or uh, misuse a substance, I should say, uh, because of their, toler their um, uh, dependence, that's about the age that they stop developing emotionally. So when, when you see kids who are in their teens um, using alcohol, heavily alcohol or substances, they remain 16 um, until they're in recovery. That can go on for years. And what that means is their emotional capacity for managing stress and managing the world is, is stunted. And until they stop using and get into recovery, their emotional development has stopped and will not continue um, until their uh, body and brain is uh, healthier. 
So when a person has uh, a substance use disorder, what are their options for getting better? Um, as I told you, this is self-directed. There is, uh, you may go to a social uh, worker or a um, psychologist or psychiatrist, but they're not the thing, and they might say to you, I think you need help, you need to go to this facility. Their, their offices are not the person who's making the call. When you have an issue, you make the call. You find the treatment facility that you want. You decide whether you need to detox. And what that means is you need to withdraw from the substance that you're on. There are certain substances that are um, uh, life-threatening if you withdraw without medical care. Um, and so you have to find the location that will do that for you, as well as take your insurance, if you have insurance. Um, there are, uh, then a, an assessment is done for the next step to determine whether your illness requires full-time residential care. Um, that usually means 28 to 30 days based on your insurance. Uh, that's full-time care. Um, after you graduate from uh, residential care, you're most likely will move into intensive outpatient, which means you have a half day of um, um, services, uh, counseling, uh, five days a week. Um, and then uh, as you become, uh, as your health gets better, um, you'll move into an outpatient mode where you are uh, not going as frequently and you might see um, a counselor three days a week or you might go to support groups, uh, AANA, um, every evening or day. Um, that was standard treatment. That was our modality that we've used. And um, what's happened now through with opioid use disorder is that we now have medications that assist people in staying in recovery. It assists them in managing those cravings. Um, those, uh, we refer to them as MAT, and those substances are methadone, which has been around for a long time, uh, buprenorphine, which is suboxone, which you may have heard uh, about, which is a film that's uh, uh, doctors who are authorized to be able to prescribe that. Um, the person gives that gets that uh, prescription and fills it and keeps it in their home on their own. And then there's an injectable naltrexone. Uh, injectable naltrexone is Vivitrol, and that is a shot that you receive every 30 days. Um, and it's good for both alcohol and opioids. Um, and all of these substances uh, or all of these medications assist you in managing the cravings that are coming from your brain because your brain has been uh, affected by the drug use. But none of this is going to help long-term if counseling isn't going on at the same time. Um, so behavioral therapy is very important. Um, a support system is very important. That means that people need to have a support system, support groups that they are uh, interacting with on a regular basis, like a, a couple times a week, because you surround your people with, uh, you surround yourself with people who are helping you maintain your recovery. Um, and then there, there's a new uh, uh, category that we call relapse prevention. Relapse prevention is the idea that there are going to be certain stressors in your life that may overtake all the um, um, tools that you have to uh, not use and um, you may slip and you may use. You may not use the same substance, you may use a different substance, but you would use. And we train people now to watch for signs of that so that we can help people when we see them going down that slippery slope. And recovery coaches are part of that um, group of people who can identify that and help people before it gets too serious. Um, the relapse rate for people who have a substance use disorder is about the same as for people who have high blood pressure or asthma. Um, what that means is that um, relapse happens in all of these disorders. Uh, for instance, um, if you have hypertension, um, you're probably managing your diet, you're probably getting exercise, and you may be on medication. Um, what happens a lot of times is that as you start to feel better, you stop taking your medication because you think you're cured. But hypertension is a chronic disease. It never goes away. So the minute you stop taking your medication and relapse, 
your disease comes right back. Um, the same thing is for asthma and a substance use disorder. If you don't follow the pattern of uh, care that you need in order to maintain your recovery, you will relapse and you will um, uh, need to put those things back in place. Um, a lot of times we looked at people who relapsed from substance use disorder as being, again, weak and not strong enough. It's got nothing to do with that. It happens to be part of the disorder and it has to do with common things that happen. Um, life happens and people manage it in different ways. So this is important that when you see that, when you're working with clients, when you're training your people to work with clients who have a substance use disorder, that be prepared that along the way this may happen. And rather than judge a person, you assist them in getting back into their routine and their, with um, what helps them stay in recovery. So recovery is a lifetime activity. Um, it's uh, because a treatment is only successful if you treat the whole person um, and because it affects everything in your life. Um, as you know, when someone has a disorder uh, of this, in this way, it affects them medically, mentally, socially, their job, their family, uh, their legal needs. All of that comes into fact, it's complicated. Um, let's take someone who has uh, an opioid use disorder and has uh, lost their job because they have been unpredictable. They haven't been showing to up to work on time. Um, they haven't been following through um, because their brain is altered because of the substance. Um, they lose their job um, and soon they um, uh, lose their, uh, could lose their children because they're not able to support them. Um, their family life becomes very disruptive. Uh, they are uh, uh, very close to homelessness. Um, and when the majority of your day is spent worrying about managing that substance use disorder by getting enough drugs in your system so that you are not drug sick, that's what takes over. And so, people let go of all the responsible things that they were doing in their, in their world. Um, so stopping drug use is just one part of a very complex recovery process. Um, and um, it, it, it requires building back uh, all of the pieces of your life that have been disrupted. So um, here's, this is a good picture of all the different services and that um, come into play when someone is in treatment, so to speak. Um, so uh, I talked about, you know, when someone decides when they get an assessment and they determine that uh, what type of care they need, there's a treatment plan, they decide what kind of uh, pharmaceuticals they need, um, and then what continuing care is going to be, meaning on long-going care. Um, uh, here are all of the services around that, that are part of your life. These are the everyday functional services that need to be built back into place um, as you recover. That's where we come to what a recovery coach does. A recovery coach promotes recovery. The goal is not just to be there when someone needs them, but rather to manage that person along the way so that they can help remove those barriers that get in the way um, that, are, that a person is struggling with and can't figure out um, so that they stay in a recovery. Um, it means that uh, sometimes we have our folks, uh, one of the first things they do is they work with someone to get an ID because you can't get housing, you can't get uh, any kind of link card, you can't get any support services if you don't have identification. Well, sometimes that requires going all the way back to getting a, a birth certificate um, it requires uh, managing some of the bureaucratic structures that we have in order to get those uh, forms. And it's not easy. Uh, it's not easy because often an individual um, has other challenges to doing following through on those things that a recovery coach will continue to work with them as a personal guide and a mentor. Someone who's already been through this uh, and is in recovery from their own uh, addiction to alcohol or other substances and are able to help this person navigate the world. 
figure out how to navigate the world by remaining in recovery and substance free, but not to the point where it's so totally overwhelms somebody that they just don't see how they can possibly do it. Um, so they are life navigators and um, they are very helpful to uh, workforce uh, folks because they're picking up the pieces of their uh, a person's recovery that get in the way of getting your career back, managing your life again, getting a good job um, and moving forward uh, and building that. That's something they've probably lost or never even launched. So the recovery coach is helping them uh, with their emotions. You know, there's a lot of emotions evolved in their whole recovery, um, especially uh, when there's a very, um, people who are beginning their recovery, given the changes that have happened in their brain, um, their uh, uh, instantaneous gratification is one of the things people look for. They want things to be fixed and they want it to be fixed now. Well, that's not gonna happen. And so helping people develop patience and um, not developing, not work, having be, being overcome by anxiety because things don't move as quickly is important. Uh, helping people put a, a, a budget back together to manage their life and how they're gonna grow, helping them figure out um, how to physically put their body back together and to build a strong body, getting the medical care that they need. These are all things that have to go first before we talk about occupations. Um, and sometimes when we talk about occupations for someone who's in recovery, um, we're not talking about, um, I wanted to go back. And we're not talking about the job that they were meant to do the rest of their lives, right? Um, sometimes we need to introduce people to work that is not stressful, that they can physically get to because they don't have a license, they don't have a car, and they need to get there either by walking, bicycle, or public transportation. So that's a, that's a deterrent to uh, as many options as they would like to have available. Um, another deterrent could be that they have to go to a methadone clinic every day. Um, that's how methadone works. You go to the clinic every day for your um, dose. And um, so people have to be able to travel there and, and uh, roll that into their life, their daily uh, schedule. Um, and sometimes that gets difficult. Um, they need to uh, be able to figure out how much they need to pay for housing and where they can possibly get housing and how much does, do they need to make in a job in order to do that. Um, sometimes people have been very successful. Uh, they might have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree and um, find it very difficult to start out at the beginning again. Um, they find it um, demeaning and uh, it, not what they expected, but it's part of the journey and you have to help people um, feel good about themselves at the same time you're asking them to start from scratch again. So the challenge is when you're working with a person with a uh, substance use disorder, as first it's a chronic illness, which means they may relapse along the way. They may be in early recovery. Early recovery, people look very different than people who've been in long-term recovery. Um, they're in early recovery, people are um, very sensitive to what's happening to them, what, how the world is interfacing with them, whether people are judging them, whether pe our people are treating them with respect, and they're still not quite sure they're going to make it. And so their self-esteem is low, and um, part of what those, uh, the wellness wheel does and the things that go into getting your life back help build that self-confidence and that self-esteem. Um, the brain takes time to heal. You can't, you can't rush that. You just have to allow it time to heal. So in the same way that someone ha if someone is in a car accident and has broken bones, those bones have to heal. Um, when you're younger, those bones take less time to heal than when you're older. And it's the same with your brain. Your brain has its own schedule for healing. Some of the things that you had before may never come back. Uh, memory is affected. Uh, uh, memory is important uh, 
language might be affected, being able to remember things, speak in the way that you did because words don't come to you like they used to. Um, you don't write as well as you used to. All of that, it's retraining in the same way that someone who suffers from uh, a, a physical ailment um, accident might have. Um, people need to feel that they are important enough and can bring something back to the community. Um, if they're working their program, they're often involved in giving back to other people and being sponsors for people, uh, giving people rides, helping their community. That's part of their, their recovery. So that is important to them because it helps them build their own self-efficacy. Um, when you start to work with someone, you set goals, small goals, not big goals, small goals. You make sure that person writes everything down. You can't verbally tell, give a person directions in this situation. You need to help them remember things by writing them down. That's how they're putting their plans for the day together. That's how they're putting their um, short-term and long-term goals to go together. That's what their recovery coaches teach them. Keep a notebook and write things down because they will not remember all the time. And just as if you, were, if you worked with a client who had um, uh, attention deficit disorder, um, there are specific uh, behaviors that someone with attention deficit disorder have. They may not remember things after, if you give them a list, they may remember the first two things, but not the last three things. Um, so you need to accommodate those specific uh, requirements of a client. And, and yes, it's complicated. Yes, it's complex. But um, I think with dealing with anybody with a substance use disorder, they will be extremely grateful for the help that they're getting. And as you, they feel the respect coming from you um, and the gratification that you feel when they uh, uh, are moving forward, um, that builds a, a great relationship. And that's what we're all trying to do, right? Build relationships that successfully help that person to uh, manage their life. Um, any kind of stressor in early recovery will challenge a person. Um, long term is where you build the resilience. You, you know, you might have small failures along the way and you, with your support systems, you build your resilience to manage that and continue going forward. Um, as I mentioned, um, there might be all sorts of problems with their own families. They might, uh, women in particular, have challenges with uh, DCFS where they're trying to get their families back together. Well, anytime there's a hearing or there's something to do with those children will rock that person's world. They will be, if it doesn't go the way they thought it was going to be, they will be emotionally distraught. As a, um, a counselor, um, be supportive, be, be sympathetic, and understand that that was probably taking over everything they were thinking about that week if you gave them a task to do and it didn't get done. Um, it's complicated and um, you, you will feel um, the um, growth in the long term. Sometimes the short term can be challenging. So what other kinds of challenges are we dealing with? Well, first, um, the addiction affects different brain circuits. Um, it affects reward and motivation. That motivation is important because sometimes when people are recovering, they may be also depressed. And so their motivation uh, is already um, healing. It's not there yet. Um, they're feeling good and uh, things that normally would make a person feel good don't have the same effect on them. And so um, it's harder and harder to uh, motivate someone who is in early recovery or also struggling with a mental health disorder. Um, their la learning and memory circuits have been dysfunctional. They've been disrupted. And so again, uh, people can be highly educated, but still have trouble in their early recovery getting those uh, uh, skills back getting their memories back, being able to remember things in the short term and long term. And then um, their inhibitions. Um, okay, so we know that what a substance use disorder is a um, compulsiveness to use. Well, a person has to learn how to be less compulsive and less demanding in a way. You're dealing with someone who's a teenager in a, a lot of cases. Well, remember what teenagers are like. 
the world is about them. The world is about how they perceive the world should be. And when they want something, they want it now. And that doesn't make it right. It just makes it, okay, I get this, all right? This is where this person's at. We're gonna move along. I'm gonna function. I'm gonna to talk to them in a bit of a way that helps them put the skill set together that they need to grow in their maturity. Um, and long-term drug use changes that brain function and it can persist for a long time. And I always tell people when they say, um, is this gonna come back? You know, am I gonna get, I don't know. We don't know. We still don't know. We're still studying that. Um, all we can say is that there are things that do help you. Uh, healthy diet, exercise, you know, all the things that help everybody um, build their um, medical health back up. Um, they might have dysfunctional behaviors that result from their substance use. Um, some of that is not showing up on time. Some of that is uh, changing, you know, scheduling an appointment, then rescheduling an appointment, then rescheduling an appointment. Um, they uh, may not be able to handle multiple um, uh, responsibilities. Um, so you'll see if there's, again, family stress, uh, uh, with, you know, something at their church or in their community and work, that's a lot. Um, and it'll get better, but it's a lot. Um, so just don't expect people who have a addiction to be cured. There's no such thing as being cured. Um, just because you're not using does not mean you're healthy. It just means that you're on the road to recovery. Um, it takes a long time. You will see repeated episodes of um, uh, sustained recovery as well as relapse. Um, and we're okay with that. That's part of the disease. Um, research indicates that most need at least three months in treatment. Now, full-time treatment usually is three months. I mean, one month. Um, we see programs now trying to put things together so they stay connected with that individual for at least three months. But think about it, people, that's 90 days. 90 days to recover from sometimes a 10, 15 year um, um, medical illness to your, with the sub medical disease that's affected your brain. That's very challenging for folks. So let me give you a, a more concrete example. I we talked about this a little bit about, uh, you know, a client who has a substance use disorder. All right, first of all, if, again, if they're enrolled in the methadone program, they have to go to their clinic daily and they have to be there and they have to go when that clinic is open. So they have constraints around that. They have constraints about where they live. They have constraints about how far away they can be from their job, what their job schedule is. Um, their treatment, um, they're, they're, they're juggling a lot, okay? So they need their support groups, they need to go counseling, they need to go to their physician visits, and they need to go to their job, and they may need to do other things that uh, uh, affect their life, and all of that has to be fitted in. Um, let's say someone is um, involved with drug court and has to check in to court once a month. Well, they have to be able to go to that hearing. And so when people are looking for work, they need to have flexibility. You need to provide them flexibility in maintaining their uh, uh, appointments because sometimes they're going to forget that they were supposed to be in court that day. Um, so you might think about, do you have any uh, appointments that you're thinking about? Um, what is on your schedule for the next month? Let's talk about that. Another hurdle for someone with a, a substance use disorder is a healthy social life. Um, this is really overwhelming for young people uh, in their 20s um, because, and anyone who's in early recovery, one of the hardest things to do is develop a whole new social network and understand that you can have fun without substances. Um, most 20 year olds gather in bars until COVID of course, but most people that's their social life um, is around um, substances, alcohol. Um, and now the legalization of marijuana. Um, so people are using substances um, in whenever there's a social event and that's very difficult for people who are trying to maintain their recovery and figure out how to, how to be in life. And sometimes they get very disheartened with that. So you have to think about that when you're talking to people, you do not wanna help them get a, a, a restaurant bar job if they have trouble 
you want to help them look at a different field um, that would be a healthier role situation for them. They might have worked there previously, but going forward that you need to find a different setting and a different environment. There are uh, employers who work well with people who are in recovery. There are employers who don't. Um, we don't want to set somebody up by helping them get a job or a career that has no tolerance for uh, someone who might have a substance use disorder. Um, one example I can give you is a, a health career. If someone was a nurse or was going to nursing school or wanted to go to nursing school and has a, um, uh, an arrest for substances on their record, they can never be a nurse. They will never get their license. Um, and that's disheartening because so many uh, people in that industry um, sometimes develop um, a, a disorder, an opioid use disorder, uh, because of the surroundings, because of injuries. And um, we sometimes um, uh, have little tolerance, and I understand it. I understand the reasons for it. But it is important that you understand that, too, when you're helping someone put their career path together, um, making sure that this person can get licensed if they have anything in their background, um, making sure that, um, let's say, that they are uh, being treated at, with um, uh, medical marijuana and for their anxiety under a doctor's care. And um, right now, we're struggling with what organization, what um, uh, businesses are testing. Um, previously, everybody tested just about, but now if you test and marijuana shows up, what do you do with that? You know, did someone use right before they came to work? Are they, are they altered? It's very tricky. Um, and so we want people to be, who have a substance use disorder to be in an environment that is supportive, where if they do relapse, their job may still be there that they work for an employer who understands that. We don't want people working in high stress jobs um, because that's probably not gonna work out long-term. So just to be clear, our recovery coaches do not assess, treat, or diagnose addiction or mental health. Those are trained counselors who do that, people who have degrees in um, how to do that. Um, what they are are resource liaisons and they understand the many pathways of recovery. Excuse me. Um, they're, and they're educated in those pathways. They're more than a 12-step sponsor. Uh, a 12-step sponsor uh, has a very specific role to play, and that's very important to folks who are in a 12-step program. But that's different than a recovery coach. And sometimes people get them mixed up. Um, Recovery coaches are trained to do non-confrontational, motivational, strategic strategies to help people stay engaged and retain, stay in treatment and follow the rules and experience positive change. They've all been trained that way. It's a very challenging um, role, but they believe that they're, that's important to help someone get well. They've most likely shared the lived experiences with someone with a substance use disorder. Um, they understand the things that get in the way. They understand how hard it is to maintain long-term recovery. Um, they know how to build rapport quickly. Um, and I gotta tell you, people who have a substance use disorder value and, and trust people who have, are in recovery themselves more than anybody else. Uh, it's a, it's a, a kind of a legitimacy that comes automatically. Um, uh, they learn, the recovery coaches learn how to maintain boundaries also so that they're not totally wiped out or um, um, head into um, a relapse. And um, they have a tremendous capacity to be non-judgmental towards all the clients they work with. You, they, folks will work with people who might have done things that are not great, uh, even less than great. But the whole point is, we acknowledge people make mistakes. We acknowledge that um, substances uh, influence people um, in, to do things they normally wouldn't do. And when someone makes a commitment to move out of that realm and forward, we're behind them. And we wanna help them do that. 
So career counselors, um, uh, they help identify a person's career development. So coaches are doing that whole um, month, that whole wellness wheel. Uh, they're looking at all those things, one of which is the um, job and the um, uh, employment of a person. Career counselors, you're identifying um, what it means to move forward in, in your future career. Um, you work in helping uh, assess a person's interests, abilities, and values. You might have to do this a couple of times along the way to help people make choices. You might not be working with someone right away uh, into their long-term goal. You might have to look for something short-term, right? What do we need to do now to help you get housing, maintain your um, uh, expenses, save for a car, pick out, um, think about what you wanna do. Do you need any education or training? Those are the kinds of things that need to go first, working with folks. Um, and you'll get people who are impatient uh, because they want things to work out fast and they want to be better, but you have to slow them down because they're just setting themselves up for failure. Um, and not don't slow them down in a demeaning way, but slow them down just in a supportive way. Um, you pr can provide them with inf career information they never thought about, um, that they never understood was even out there. Um, I, you know, I always say you only know what you know, right? You, you know what your family's career paths were, you know, maybe your friends and colleagues or people that you're around, but there are so many more opportunities and options out there that people don't know about that you bring to the table. And that is tremendously helpful. Um, and then our coaches help follow through, help the person follow through on what you're asking them to do. They, they help them show up for their appointments. Uh, doing whatever paperwork they have to do or planning or doing the things they need to do to follow through on your direction. Working as a team together um, creates a solid support system for people with a substance use disorder. And that connection among all of you um, is critical. Uh, we've seen that in our recovery coach um, um, grant and we've seen um, us both sides learning what the other does. Um, and the way the systems work are different. And so everybody grows because of that um, learning curve. COVID-19. So what we do know about life is that change is constant. Uh, uh, and this past year has been tremendously uh, um, challenging for all of us. Uh, it's raised the anxiety levels in everybody um, it's changed people's way that they work. They are working at home. Um, everybody has had to change their operating procedures because of COVID. Um, and we've seen a big increase in relapse rates. Uh, we're seeing more overdoses because people's normal um, support systems in a lot of cases closed. Um, and we replaced them with virtual uh, connections. Virtual connections are fine but in a purse, sometimes they're not meeting the needs of people in, in recovery. Um, social interactions or connections, connections with people are very important. So we need to, when you're thinking about that and things are changing, we all need to change our operating protocols, right? We all need to move forward in a different direction, understanding these things. Um, behavioral health practice patterns have changed. People don't get to see their counselors. People don't get to go to their meetings. People don't get to see their doctors the way they used to. Um, and so that affects people's ability to, to move forward and maintain recovery. Um, as I mentioned before, pre-employment screening is gonna become an issue. What does that look like? How is that gonna change in the future? Um, how, what does that look like for a person who has um, a criminal background? And how are we gonna work with that and get people back to work um, and particularly anyone who had a drug charge, we need to get people back to work and, and to help them be a contributing member of society um, and not someone who made a mistake and can never remove themselves from that mistake. Um, so understanding that th there's always gonna be a little bump in the road and that bump in the road uh, needs to be adapted to, but as partners, um, we can make that happen and we can help each other along the way and inform each other about what might 
be happening to help work through those bumps in the road. So this is my contact information and um, I, we can do questions now. I'm open to any questions. Um, I can't see the screen the way uh, you do, but I believe the chat room is open for questions. Um, I'd like to also ask that if you have situations where you want to describe or, or you've been in a situation and you want to know about, please ask. Um, I'm, my whole point, I'm here to help um, and to be a support system for everybody. Thank you. Great, thank you, Kathleen. Um, we are going to give everyone a couple minutes here if you have any questions um, to please post those in the chat or the q and A. I I did want to reiterate that the session was recorded and then the PowerPoint slides and recording um, can be found in the chat. And I apologize, I didn't, never, never put that website up for you all, but here is, I'll do that right now. Here is the link to the direct link to the slides. Um, here is the link to all of the slide decks and recordings for all of our Wednesday webinars. That's that second link I just put in there for you. Um, and you can find the recording there of the session within 48 hours if you'd like to share it out to anyone. Um, and then I'm also going to put a link and um, directions into the chat if you would like to go ahead and take the follow-up survey right away. Um, now that this session is um, over, you can feel free to do so while it's still fresh in your mind. I'm putting that in the chat right now for everyone. Um, and with that, I don't see any questions coming through. Um, if you do have any questions, you can always feel free to reach out to Kathleen or um, our center, and we would be happy to direct you um, to the correct person who could answer your question. Probably going to be Kathleen, though. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't see any questions coming through, Kathleen. So you must have just um, been so you must have just been so good and so thorough. Well, I hope so, and I hope I wasn't boring. Someone did raise their hand early on. I didn't know if that question was answered. Um, it looks like someone did raise their hand, um, Alicia, but um, all participants are on mute, so she would have to post that in the chat if she has the capability to do so. Okay. All right, well, I'm going to close this out then. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for presenting on this two-part series, and if you weren't able to catch session one, you can check that out on our website. It's that second link um, that I put in the chat for you. You can access it there. And with that, I'm going to close this out. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today and have a great rest of your Wednesday. Thank you. Bye-bye.